Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm the host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen De La Carriere is joining us again here on Myth Vision to tell you more about the cult of Scientology. How are you, my friend? Derek, greetings and hello. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. It is. It's always a blast. Our energy is amazing. Um, and these, <laughs> this cult you can never stop, right? There's always something else going on and and you can just chuckle at the next thing and the next thing. Today, we're going to be dealing with L. Ron Hubbard's ideas, but they're not just limited to Scientology. So tell us what's going on and what we're going to be discussing today. Now, one feature of Scientology is how much you have to obey and replicate every word spoken by Hubbard. Hmm. When you do, others pat you on the back and praise you because you're called on source. Hubbard is the source, the creator of all of Scientology. And when you understand Hubbard and can quote Hubbard all day long and can implement Hubbard's orders, you are on source. And if you deviate from Hubbard, or if you have critical thought or think for yourself, oh, you are off source. Go to ethics officer, and do some penances, you're, you're trouble. And Hubbard wrote about everything. So there's no space in your life to think. He wrote of how you do laundry, how you clean windows, clean windows, he said, with newspaper, because they have a black print in it, takes off the scum. I mean, right down to how, how you create a budget, how you raise your children. I mean, doctrine after doctrine after doctrine. If you want to be an artist, there's an art series of how to be an artist, what to paint if you're the artist, how to paint, what colors, you, he write down to every single thing, how to do your personal hygiene, how to purify your body, <laughs> do the purification. This down. makes me think he had to have read like, like the Quran or like, like uh, the Torah of the Bible. Like, there, there are specifications, right, in a lot of these ancient religions where they they literally tell you how to use the bathroom, where you're allowed, when you're allowed. Like there are some Jews who believe, for example, you cannot defecate on the Sabbath. So if you had to go number two, you have to hold it. Jeez. And you're not allowed to leave your house uh, to, to use – the ra- ra- and it's not all like but it's showing you this i'm wondering where he's getting this idea like let me write rules for every single thing and i wonder this is getting into the mushy gushy stuff but does he tell people how to um how to do it in the bedroom is he like that detailed into this well the bedroom he more focuses on wanting to know via interrogatory, which you have to pay good money. You're paying them to give them your secrets. They you need to tell me that he- they get the dirt oh. and you pay for you <laughs> you pay by the hour endlessly to confess your dirt, which they will use on you later if you speak out or if you these are these your folders are scrutinized. And then they make hate pages revealing what you just gave up, honestly believing priest penitent privilege. I mean, do you know, people... any, other, do you know any other faith or cult or religion that 
just not that makes money off of your confessions like that. Like nobody I know. I mean, maybe I'm missing one or two. I don't know. But like, I don't know of any that makes a business like <laughs> model out of you telling your dirty secrets. You know, you can go to uh, websites where people will pay you to hear your secrets. Okay. You're paying <laughs> them to tell them your secrets. This, this just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> oh. You literally have to pay to confess. And it's bad enough that you paid for it. But then they, of course, when they use it, they, alter it, they blow it up, they embellish it. I know of a story of a 13 year old boy who sniffed his aunt's underwear. Mm -hmm. He was 13. Oh, that was considered per pervert. Oh boy, they made a meal up. He sniffed his panties and underwear of his, he confessed this. The whole, the whole of his organization knew the God. It, it spread around like what? He thought he was just confessing to one person. Wow! And it became public news, and people would look at him funny. That's weird because. <laughs> I can't imagine what kind of crap everyone who's looking at them, this poor kid, what they've done in their life. What kind of dirt have they thought or done? Anyway, anyway. Eric, there is nobody on earth that doesn't have some skeletons in their closet. Right, you know? right. Human beings have done a little this or that. There isn't anyone who was born a saint and has lived all the years of their life into adulthood without a little, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it could be just stupidity in your teens or whatever, but people have their secrets. Mm -hmm. Scientology makes a business out of extracting that. For this time. is why you talk about oh, the, gosh. you always talk about the bait and switch move. And this is exactly why Someone might go, but why would someone join something like this? They don't know that this is what's going to happen to them. Yes. They are told all the good stuff up front and they're patted on their back and they feel like they're, they get all the chemicals going in the brain and they're like, whoa, it's like, this is a drug that, that is satisfying to them. And so they're finding completion and happiness and psychological satisfaction in this thing. And the next thing you know, boom. But- oh. L. Ron Hubbard, you, you, you point out everything he says, if you follow it, you're an on. Uh, on source. On, on source. source. Meaning you're on Hubbard's source materials. You're on, your, your mind has adapted to truth and freedom and all the glorious adjectives that they tout. You're going to become the super. Now, in very early beginning stages in Scientology, you can't have you can't have wings. For the first time, if you told a secret, you do feel oh, you feel a relief. You got it off your chest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they go overboard. The interrogatories go on. You can have a win early on, and then it becomes. There's one specific, it's called SEC check, security check. It's an interrogatory. It's called the Joburg because Hubbard invented it when he was down in South Africa. And it has like 125 questions. They gave me a Joburg 13 times. I had to go through the same interrogatory of 126 questions 13 times with Ridiculous questions. Have you ever created a baby farm? Well, I don't know what a baby farm, right? Have you settled in illicit diamonds? You can tell from the first set of questions, this was written for South Africans. But you have to sit there holding hands. And the auditor is a bulldog and won't let you go till the needle floats. So these are just unbelievably. Uh, have you ever slept with a member 
with a human of a different race. Oh. That was, con yeah, that's a Joe Bogue sex check question. That's and that's a little dated, too, because if you go back, obviously that would have been uh, relevant in the 50s or 60s. But that tells you this is something I found in other cults, Mormonism and others, that they mm -hmm. have this idea that white is good and black mm -hmm. is evil. Mm -hmm. And they have the skin color idea that darker skin is darker sins. Like, wow. So so I don't know. It makes me wonder if there was some investigation deeper into, into Hubbard's you know, teachings, but I wonder with the kind of upbringing and the environment that he was in America, wouldn't be shocked if he thought less of other race or, uh, well, what we call races, but really, honestly, there is no other, we are the human race, but this, this, this differentiation, that's a whole nother thing into science to show we all come from the same family either way. Um, yeah, you, he might have uh, outdated ideas and wondering if he thinks less of people who aren't the same color. Or Somebody did a compilation of his racist comments and how he said, you know, something like black people were made to be servants to clean your shoes and swap the floors. Oh, yeah, that's I, right. I can, I can even send you a look so you can just put it up. Please. Anyway, so Hubbard, but my point on this is these interrogatories go on forever. They go and go and go. Maybe it is car carpetic to just one time give up your secrets and you feel, oh yeah, I'm glad I got that off my chest. But then it, it doesn't end there. That's just, it's going to go another 150 hours, another 150 hours, which you pay for. You pay. Mm -hmm. So, as you started the opening, Hubbard was a prolific science fiction writer. He was, he was a best-selling science fiction writer. I sent you some pictures, right? These, remember in the 40s, there was no television. The movie industry was just coming into its own, but people would buy pulp magazines and read thrilling stories. You couldn't see it. You couldn't go home and there wasn't I I there were no shows, there was no mm -hmm. YouTube. And Howard really had an incredible imagination. But he seemed to be very almost stuck viewing things from a, from a previous civilization. I have a very dear friend called Terry. She and I were on the Apollo for years. We lived through it all. And one day, Terry was on a photo shoot. Hubbard was a great photographer. He wanted to take pictures for forthcoming magazines. And it, it's the California desert, burning hot sun. He wanted something watered down. It was too dry. And Terry was right by him. And he said, Terry, could you water that down? And she grabbed a water hose, you water things down, and it had a nozzle on it. And Hubbard said to everyone around, you see that? You see that nozzle? She's from Markham. Markham was a very sinister earlier civilization in, in outer space. And that nozzle Hubbard said, was used in the Malkab Confederacy. It was pretty degrading because Terry was like a right-hand man. But right. to tell the others that he just wanted her to water something down. She was from Malkab for picking up a water hose with a nozzle on it. Do you see how he yeah. was looking through this? All right, so now we come to the chug advices. Because Hubbard didn't want to be known as the managing director and the complete ruler of all of Scientology, his identity shifted to consultant. He was only an advisor. Of course, his word is law and he was running everything, but right. he's a consultant. Now, do you know in all these religions and academics you interview, does 
is there anyone in hiding like that that doesn't want to be known as running the show? That's a good question. I mean, based on things that we know, I, I, I don't think so. The closest I can think of in my head is that, and I don't think there's really any historical reality to this, but Jesus in the Gospel of Mark was like, every time he would do a miracle or do something, he would go, shh, don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. But but that's not really saying, hey, I'm not the head honcho here. Like everyone knew he was the he was the rabbi. He was the teacher. He was the one. So, no, I don't I can't think of one, but maybe there is some out there where people want to pretend I can't help but think if L. Ron Hubbard is hiding that he's the leader, it's more for like legal issues yes. or things. I can't Bingo. imagine. Bingo. If people were suing, Hubbard would be on the lawsuit. Right. And, and uh, also the IRS were on to what's called inurement. Inurement is when you are personally profiting when you <laughs> opposing and masquerading as some goody goody 501 you know a religion but you are the one raking in the bucks that's right. called enormity it's a irs have pages on it how you can i imagine it. though i do imagine church leaders or people who have their hands on the money through these 5013c3 organizations and their their hands are on the money, but they're making it look like it's going to the organization or whatever. But really, there there are tons of them that are getting caught buying airplanes and buying mansions yes. and buying. Yes. So in a sense, yes. maybe like what L. Ron Hubbard was doing in that respect. You know, everybody. The eternal question I get is, Karen, why is the government not doing anything? What's going on? Why is the U.S. government? And we found out in talking to the IRS that they used to have a czar. They used to have a head person who was a watchdog over 501c3s that were totally violating the spirit of getting tax exemption. Mm -hmm. That post got eliminated when the IRS did reorganize themselves. So there's nobody actually home. There isn't any... You can just write to the general. There isn't a czar and a whole office monitoring 501c3s. Doesn't right. even exist in the IRS. That's one of the whys the IRS is. But people are still pouring in reports to the IRS and so on. So Hubbard um, truly had, a, he was a good writer. He, he, truly had a vivid imagination and he could conjure up all kinds of things. And in his advices, he wrote something called the Chug Advices. Chug is simply Mm C-H-E-G. And in short form, this is the story. Billions of years ago, there was a civilization called the Chug Dynasty. And people were very miserable. Taxes kept going up, up, up. They decided to investigate. Some good guys there decided to find out what is going on. We can't even make a living. And in the investigation, they found out that it Now, the investigation was mostly done by computers. Now, remember, this was billions of years ago. And the computers analyzed all the reports and analyzed financial transactions. And they found out that the Duke of Chuck was siphoning off the bucks for himself. And the computer ordered the execution, the beheading of the Duke of Chuck. Boom, he was killed. And then all the taxes went down and everyone went home happy. And the kingdom of Chuck lived on happily ever after. And Hubbard said, you see, the computer can find the who. In Scientology, 
whenever some bad thing happens, a new legal suit, a, a media doing a new documentary, they always try to roll it back to find the who. They roll it back to find the instigator, the actual source behind um, behind it all. Sometimes they are so way off, it's laughable, absolutely laughable. They kidnapped a girl. She's she's a, good, she's a friend of mine. She's on another. They kidnapped a girl who had been using a video camera to video staff meetings and the, the crazy that went on. They kidnapped her and put her in a hotel at, at LAX. And she said, and they said, her husband was trying to take her four children in a fierce custody battle. And they said, we will get your children for you. We will pay the legal bills. Just confess. Karen de la Carrière is behind what you did. No, she set you up to video. No, and she said, absolutely not. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to falsely. Karen had nothing to, come on. We know Karen de la Carrière set you up. They kept her in this hotel inter for seven days. When she threatened suicide, they finally let her go. Her whole story, she she tells it in parks day one, and she has all the documentation, the hotel receipts, the you know, she tells the story on it. But you see, they were so convinced because I do YouTube videos, I must be a who for every bad thing that happens inside broker and like career. So sometimes it's laughable. <laughs> They're just a joke. They don't even know how to analyze. All right, back to the kingdom of Chuck. So Hubbard said, we've got a team of some 20 Sea Org members, that's clergy, working in a division of the cult called INCOM, I-N-C-O-M-M. It's an, an, it's an abbreviation for the computer division of the church, of the cult. And income were ordered to make a computer that would find out the who's, these devilish evil people who were trying to harm and destroy Scientology. He ordered this computer to be made. And this was 1980s mid-1980s, which it was way before artificial intelligence. Derek, are other religions really into using computers for? Not that I'm aware of, and that was one of the things I was going to point out and, and mention what it sounds like to me is L. Ron Hubbard believes in technology as if it it is sentient. It has um, it has like power. I mean, if you look at the very foundation in which you're grabbing, what are those little things you you're confessing, holding on to? Um, cans, what, soup cans. The what? Soup cans. The can yeah, the soup cans. The cans. Oh, soup cans. Like from the very basic foundation of Scientology, the, holding these little cans, you know, to supreme technology that they supposedly have in these museums, which is bogus to get your money. Um, it's all this weird science fiction mentality that technology actually has the capability of like purging sins. And it's Scientology is just weird from what I can look at. It's just weird because it's trying to combine a Star Trek, Star Wars type of thing with religion and like spirituality and stuff. It's trying to do both, if that makes sense. Well, you know, everyone takes it very seriously. And Scientology. They blame current crime and everything to psychiatrists mm -hmm. of several billion trillion years ago. It's always rolls back to psychiatry. If somebody right now, today, creates a real disturbance somewhere, and fights and throws things on, the first thing they try to find out is who's the psychiatrist hidden 
Is she seeing her psych? Oh. It's got to be a it's got to be a psychiatrist. It's got to be a psychologist. Nothing would happen if it doesn't trace back to psychiatry. Right. And of course, they are anti-psychiatry beyond, over and beyond, laughable. So he ordered this computer, and he said that. And the way Scientology is. Computers can play a part because it's a snitching culture. Snitching. Everyone reports on everyone. Husbands report on wives. Mothers report on their daughters. Everyone reports on everyone all the time. And thousands. And if they want to do a propaganda campaign on you, because we all have computers these days, they CC twenty other people. So they're not just telling one person; they're reporting it across the strata. So twenty people will uh, read this simul if they want to really shame you. So here's a guy reporting on his wife. Uh, I was in bed with my wife last night, and she told me she was curious about sleeping with. Two men at the same time, and she thought that would be a turn on. And because I find this perverted, I am writing it up. Blah blah signature. Now that didn't just go to the ethics officer; that goes to RTC ethics, CMO ethics officer, Freeman. Blah, 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 blah. So, in other words, he's now the it's broadcast because of all the carbon copies. And because of computers, instantly, you know, when you send instant messages and you do a broadcast, twenty people are reading what you, what she privately said in bed last night, in 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 in, in real time. Once he sends the send button, so if you want to punish someone, you carbon copy a host of other people. It's a black propaganda campaign done instantaneously on their own. On their own. Mm. That sucks because if it's not true and they're yeah. just angry at you, now you yeah. just sabotage them, and they didn't do anything except obviously not do what. Imagine a, a husband who doesn't get his way, or yeah. anything can go south. Oh, yeah. So. People write- Knowledge reports out of vengeance all the time. Exactly. It, that's a horrible system. Yeah. So to, to honing this in on Chugs and getting just L. Ron Hubbard's wild imagination and this science fiction, one of the things that came to mind, like I was saying earlier, is, is when religion and science fiction meet, like when technology mm-hmm. and science fiction meet. And it made me think like this – it's weird how I'm wondering if if L. Ron Hubbard actually believed in the crap that he's saying. Like, he seems like he really did believe in this stuff. Mm. I, 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 he's just delusional in a way. I, I believe that he did believe in it. I, I do believe that he believed in it. And so, so j- just, just to really. Uh, just to continue the story, the Incom did recruit a couple of big computer experts, and they had to work to develop this computer. Now, just to translate it into language, if you are getting reported by a hostile force, you can pile up a lot of reports on you, and the computer was designed in a way that it could head count how many reports were coming in on you. <laughs> so if you were getting a lot of knowledge reports, the computer then ordered a big investigation and ethics on you. So the computer could narrow down troublemakers within the cult. It, it was a manhunt. It was an internal using the computer okay, to just, walk off the head of its own. Just for <laughs> just for people watching, she's talking about this billions and billions of years ago computer 
that L. Ron Hubbard is talking about that that is supposedly able doing to do that. And if right. he wanted a, a replica built in present time by income. Right. Well, long story short, they tried and tried. Hubbard said, this is the answer to everything. We could magically just kill off. He didn't mean homicide, but he meant eliminate troublemakers, get them right out of the cult because the computer will spot them right away. So they tried and tried, the computer wasn't built, but here's part two of the story, which is just horrendous. There was someone inside income that was sending out secret data to a university, not UCLA, um, for Scientology's deep secrets to be sent outside by someone in income that has all the knowledge, all the data of all the, you know, this was such an electrifying thing that a mission was sent. A mission is two or three trusted, loyal, hardcore members that will, they will carry out a specific target no matter what. This design, they, and they, they're given a time within two weeks. Target one, target two, target three. So two or three missionaries arrived at income. And they were all made to line up in two rows. Empty your pockets. Put your hands like that. And they were screened with some wand to be sure they didn't have a cell phone or a recorder or whatever. And they were told, all of you are suppressive people. You're all suppressive persons. There was a huge link from your division and you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna, you're gonna be cut off from the outside world. You're gonna not see your spouses or your children. And you're going to self-report on your crimes. And you're going to just keep reporting on your criminal acts till the missionary gives you a pass. Start! And they all, the, the room was electrified. Remember, there was one rogue, but all these other people had nothing to do with it. Right. So for the next 30, 40 days, they were marched up to some big blue house, like seven, eight floors. They were marched up to one floor. They were totally cut off from everyone else. They couldn't go home at night. They couldn't do anything, but they had to sit several hours a day confessing crimes, which they had to self-report on themselves. It's called an OW write-up. Many Scientologists or ex-Scientologists watching this will know. Over, OW, withhold. You commit a transgression, then you a secret, you withhold it. OW. So write up your OWs. And many a time when it was submitted, uh, the write-up was submitted, it was kicked back. Ah, not enough. Write more. Get out of here. So they were completely controlled by these two uh, really heavy Harsa missionaries. And this went on and on and on. Uh, one guy raped uh, raised his hand and said, I want to confess that I have been suppressive. And Suzanne Molster, the missionary, said, okay, you're declared on the spot, get him off the base. And he was kicked right out uh, with no money, no nothing, just, it was brutal. It was electrified. It was the worst incident and it happened on Valentine's Day so it was dubbed in the ex-Scientology community, Valentine's Day Massacre in the Sea Org. 
they actually, because it was Valentine's Day, yeah, they called it Valentine. They, they couldn't go home to their sweetheart or their girlfriend or their wife. They were cut off from civilization for 30, 40 days to confess crimes. This is Scientology's brutality on their own. Once you get in, well, I'm coming to the tail end of, <laughs> guess what? They eventually, eventually after a torturous, savage part of their lives, they slowly, slowly, uh, one or two people who were actually suffered through this, he's on Outer Banks, one of my friends, Dan Garvin, he, they, they told the story step by step by step what happened to them, but it disintegrated. These people after this, they're gone. So income, who's supposed to create the intelligent, brilliant computer that could find SP, suppressive person, right. They all disagreed. It fled. This was like a this this is like a this was a lunatic asylum gone astray on the thing. And they they dispersed out of all the people who had to suffer through this lockdown and persecution, they're all gone from the sea. And they all write <laughs> when you get all these different forums of people writing horrible stuff that happened to them anonymously. You get little, you see, Scientology wouldn't be such a, if they didn't abuse like this, if they didn't right, carry right. like this, they wouldn't have enemies. The one thing Scientology does is increase the amount of enemies. Every day, every day, there's new enemies. Every day. Yep. This is a statistic that is an affluence. It goes up, 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 up. So, Derek, is yeah. there any cult that you know and you know and all religion or any academics that have abusive conduct to this kind of degree i mean i not in the same way i mean it's different if you go to like some of the worst kind of cults and cult practices that have happened <clears throat> usually they're sex cults in some way they're taking advantage of the young kids or young women or or adult women doesn't matter. Usually there's like a sexual deviant uh, uh, leader or cult figure at the top that wants all these women and things like that. But as far as like what you're describing, very weird. I mean, very, very weird. If there are, they're not as popular and as big. Mm. So it might be like a small little house cult in a local town or something where they do something and it's just like horrible and it's collapsed. Maybe it doesn't even exist anymore. This is the weirdest type of organization. I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, it's kind of weird. I watch people over the years who believe in the weirdest things mm -hmm. and they're very highly intelligent people. And you're like, how, how do you not see how ridiculous this is? Mm -hmm. And yet you believe it. And, and I try to tell people who who think that way. Like I was there. Mm -hmm. I believed it. You were there. You mm -hmm. believed that L Ron Hubbard was literally like there was these actual machines billions of years ago that were able to tell if you were an SP or not. And they're <laughs> trying to create, like, you actually believe this. Now I look at it and go, how ridiculous. But then you could laugh at me and go, but Derek, you spoke in tongues and thought that you were speaking the language of angels. And I'm like, uh, good point. So, it's just yeah. a weird the science fiction part and how L. Ron Hubbard's science fiction obsession became a religion and people believed it. That's what really gets me. I, I don't know how to I don't know how to put that in words, but I can't think of any other cult that does that. Mm. Not that way. I know there's that weird people think that lizard people run the you know world and they're all the top people. The president is a <laughs> Is a lizard, or <laughs> but other than that, I don't really know of anything like comparable to this. Yeah. Well, the one thing I try to fight and expose is the abuse. Mm -hmm. So some of my stories are kind of dark because there's so much abuse, but 
it just seems that Scientology does not understand the unintended consequences. They're thinking only of the moment. Right. Smash the guy, pulverize him, just beat him up. But they're not thinking, well, what happens in the next five years after that? Well, what will this guy do? Is he going to be a loyal servant to us? What? They're not thinking of... They seem to only want immediate gratification right. of cracking a whip now, but not thinking, well, what will happen in the next year? You know? They came after me with a vengeance. If they hadn't, I wouldn't be making any YouTube videos. Right. I'm in 12.5 million views, well over a million views a year on my channel because they made me the adversary. Right. I will never take anything lying down. They want to make hate pages on me. I'm going to do videos till the cows come home. But their videos are hardly watched. I'm in competition. I, you and I, Derek, we have a thing. Anyway, they create their shorts. They create their own enemy. Do other religions create their own enemies? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, I don't. Uh, not in the same way that I can. I, not that I can tell. Not in the same way. What about all these evangelicals? They're all. They're, they're huge. They can almost influence an election of who they mm -hmm. vote for. Mm -hmm. Are they punitive? I don't see them being in the same way. As far as evangelical Christianity goes, I think the ideology itself deteriorates its own followers in a way uh, you're born a wretched wicked sinner from birth and you're you're dung you're you're, you're nothing without you know god that kind of mindset but i don't i don't think they create i don't think they create their own enemies in the real world i think that they might create enemies in their own imagination which is themselves and then which may be like there's satan somewhere out here ready to get me things like that but not the way that Scientology is coming off, this is a weird, it's a very strange type of religious, whatever, cult. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I do think it's very interesting. The way that you painted this, though, it just makes all the wheels in my head turn. It makes me think of a lot of stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. what is going on? What the mm -hmm. heck happened? And then when you describe this, like they think about the right now and not the future. I'm thinking to myself, I can't wait for the legal system to adjust mm. and, and understand the complexity of cults like we've been seeing with our, our friends on the Scient Scientology programs, uh, Leah Remini and um, mm. Render and others who are talking to actual lawmakers and people who are in the legal system saying we have not really tackled cults and their complexity, but I hope we do soon. And they continue these practices that that, that way they get caught and this whole thing falls apart and, yeah. and we can get the popular people like Tom Cruise and others to leave. Right. Yeah. They're kind of left with no choice at this point so that this whole thing can fall apart. Yeah. You know, that's what I think. I'd love to see that happen because they don't realize that they are literally it's like the drug addict that I was mm -hmm. who is only fiending for the fix today and doesn't even realize mm -hmm. they're running out of time. Mm -hmm. The next one might be the one that kills you. Mm -hmm. And in, in this case for this cult, I hope the next one does kill this cult. Well, you see, here's the thing, Derek, people want the cult just on like an on off switch gone with Scientology gone. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it'll happen. It's erosion. The waves come up and lap and beat against the rock. And then they withdraw. They beat again. And eventually the rock, get, the cove gets less and less and less because the ocean has been battering mm -hmm. it for so long. Scientology gets battered. Mm -hmm. And the erosion will eventually l l make it less, less, less. We all wish for some magic bullet to go bam and go <laughs> that'll that there are too many protections the first amendment freedom of religion there's too many there's too much that protects yeah so it can't be just gone with a magic bullet but it is being eroded you see i'm going to tell you in the 
the next video, the new lawsuit. It, mm. They've already won. Even if they don't win it in the law courts, the Daily Mail has 100 million hits a month. And it's all over the Daily Mails. Abuse by abuse by abuse. Talk about mm. the hurt on their public relations is massive, massive. Now, it wasn't just the D Daily Mail. The Sydney Mor Morning Herald is the biggest newspaper in all of Sydney. And Tampa Bay Times is the newspaper of, it's in the top 10 newspapers in Florida. Itemizing. This is erosion. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I'm battering it slowly, slowly. Anyway, we, uh, we hope that you got to see a little insight of the sci-fi writer who took, who, but I, I believe in his mind, he, um, anyway, he took a lot of very, very tall tales and embroidered them into Scientology. And believe it or not, people pay good money mm. to follow those doctrines. <laughs> I love the way you said, look, I talked in tongues. But when you talked in tongues, Derek, did you, was it just coming? Or did you feel you were making it oh, up? Oh, I, well, you don't, that's why I think L. Ron Hubbard believes what he's doing. At first, I just did it to go along with the rest of everybody else. Then eventually you just start doing it with the music or when something comes up, you try to, you, you do it and you think that it's really divine or something, but really at the end of the day, your cognitive faculties are what's making you do it. And so um, I think L. Ron Hubbard was kind of like what modern Star Wars fans who actually believe in Star Wars. Did you know mm -hmm. that Star Wars created a religion? Oh, yeah. Jedi? The Jedi religion? The, the Jedi religion. Yeah. yeah. Now, that not, not everyone who follows it really literally believes in it, but there's a lot of people who actually believe in the Jedi religion. And it is a religion that they they actually put down as the religion. When you go to, like, do your taxes or you write down what your religion is, other Jedi religion. And there's reasons it stems out of certain things called Manichaeism and Buddhism and Christianity all mixed in together with Yoda and his teachings and stuff. But my point is that's science fiction. And what I think's going on with L. Ron Hubbard is he's mixing some of the psychological ancient sayings that we find within religion, combining it with his own version of psychiatry while saying other side. That's why he has such a hard on for psychiatrists, in my opinion, is he is his own version of it. And in his own version of it, I think he thinks there's something sentient about technology that isn't really sentient and he, i think he thinks there's something like a mind to technology by creating mythologies like billions of years ago so <laughs> it's a really weird thing but i think he thinks that that's why he created that machine with the cans to try and can say like this will change people like this can actually cure things and we can find out the real problems to all these diseases and stuff and the scientific community is like no so they took a more a more scientific natural approach he took more of a pseudo scientific approach to technology and created a freaking religion out of his own uh science fiction mythology it it's really interesting stuff i i, I wish we could case study him like he was still alive and he was willing to like actually say what he really thought but you kind of wonder, is this real or is it narcissism? We, what's going on? It's hard to know. I wish I knew more. Mm -hmm. Beautifully spoken, Derek. Good job. Good, good, good analysis then. Good, good statements. Well, thank you. So you, <laughs> you did amazing too. I, I, I can't wait to talk about our next episode coming up. Let's do it. Okay. So thank you, Derek. Derek. You know, the mind is a strange thing. Mm -hmm. The mind, especially of swallowing and believing fakeness. And I think Mythvision does a 
great job with, you know, these, I could just the exploration of it all. Right. The incredulousness sometimes of you get a little snippet here and there. What? No. But you didn't answer my question. Go to, uh, we're going to wrap up here. When you spoke in tongues, was it just flowing out of you or on an automatic basis? No, I mean, I, I chose in my mind to do these things. Yeah. Um, but I think everyone does. I think everyone does. The only people I think may or may not, and I couldn't tell you, is if they're blacked out drunk. And I've actually heard people blacked out drunk just la, 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 la. But <laughs> it, it's almost like, uh, do you purposely think about things or just do the thoughts just come? And you could say both, but it's... There is a cognitive, I think, thing behind it. So, yeah. So finally, I will give you the Scientology analysis of people who speak in tongues. The Scientology viewpoint is, you see, that's a psychiatric implant. Oh, this guy was that long, long time ago. <laughs> and what he's saying is the content of the psychiatric implant. That would be the Scientology analysis if there was ever a Pentecostal PC holding the cans and saying, well, I was talking in time. So they would try and move him back in time to when psychiatry implanted him with those words. Oh my gosh. That's the like, that's the <laughs> There is always you. fun with you. I like to yes. have fun. What is life without fun? Exactly. You do have fun. Yes, fun is important. Thank you, Derek. Thank, Thank you, Cam. Dear, dear Derek. See you, see you very soon. Okay? Yes, okay. ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Mythficians.